Good evening, everyone. I'm Angela Cavanaugh, the Executive Director of CAI. I'd like to welcome all of our attendees and thank our ultimate partners, the Board of Directors, and the whole CAI team for today's program. The Wednesday webinars will go through the end of the year. Our next one will be on June 2nd, featuring McGovern Legal Services speaking on post-COVID association collections and GNC Electronics speaking on flow control for people counting for clubhouses and community centers. I'll now turn it over to Steve Roderick of our membership committee. Welcome, Steve. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Angela. My name is Steve Roderick and I'm a proud member of the CAI New Jersey membership committee. I just wanted to do a friendly reminder to ensure that your membership doesn't lapse. So if you're coming up on your renewal date, please be sure to renew so that you can take advantage of all the benefits that we have to offer. If your community or the community that you manage is not yet a member of CAI New Jersey, please reach out to Robin. Her email is in the chat. Also, you can directly email any board member updates and we can make those adjustments and changes as boards change. If you need to add to your current roster, you can do that too. So we have a lot of fun, exciting things coming up for 2021. And here's some of the calendar. Uh, as Angela mentioned, our next Wednesday webinar will be on June the 2nd, featuring GNC Electronics discussing flow control and people counting for clubhouses and community centers. And McGovern Legal Services will be discussing post-COVID association collections. We have our PAC Top Golf event on May 20th at the Top Golf in Edison. That's tomorrow. I know I'll be there and I hope to see you guys too. Our welcome back party is on Wednesday, May 26th from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. at the Asbury Beer Garden. Uh, due to its capacity restrictions, this event is limited to only the 2020 partners, uh, exhibitors, and the first 100 homeowners or managers are free to attend. So don't miss out on this in-person event on the rooftop in Asbury. Space is limited, so managers and homeowners send in that registration today. Uh, one of my personal favorites, we have our golf outing on June 15th. Also, our beach party will be in September down the shore. We call that local summer. Should be a good time. So as we start to host in-person events, it is so important that your membership be in good standing. Again, all of these programs and more are being added to the calendar. So pre please be sure to register on the website, caiNj.org. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. All right, so I'd like to go over some housekeeping rules today. All of our participants will be muted. Please type your questions into the question box and be sure to uh, direct it to the correct panelist. If you need a certificate for manager credits, please email Jennifer at J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R at C-A-I-N-J.org. And just a note for managers, you must be in attendance for the entire presentation in order to receive a certificate. So today we have joined us from Associate Community Management Corp, Mike Pesci. Uh, he will be speaking on working with your community management company to implement your reserve study. Mike is the president of Associate Community Management Corporation of New Jersey, a real estate management company with a primary focus on community associations, condominiums, cooperatives, uh, planned unit developments, and townhouses. Previously, he practiced law specializing in real estate litigation. Uh, Mike is an active is active in leadership of industry through his company's participation in community association. Institute. He serves as a, on the Legislative Action Committee of both CAI and New Jersey Apartment Association. He is a past president of the New Jersey chapter of CAI and the former chair of the Legislative Action Committee. He received CAI New Jersey's Member of the Year Award in 1995, its Distinguished Service Award in 2014, and the CAI Nationals uh, Rising Star Award in 2017. Mike is, ha, has achieved his professional community association manager, which known as PCAM designation 1995. Beginning in 2017, Mike has been an adjunct professor at the Montclair State University, teaching a full semester course of managing community associations. Following Mike, we have uh, uh, Paul McGlory from Belfort Property Restoration. He will be speaking on losses involving multiple units in multicultural communities. Paul has over 15 years experience dealing with properties and the impacts of contaminants, water and mold damage on those properties. He has spent 10 years inspecting homes for mold and damage caused by mold and water. He is also IICRC certified in fire and smoke restoration. Paul has a thorough understanding of the recovery process after a disaster and can share many of his experiences as they relate to current challenges. Paul works with his clients to develop and implement recovery plans for their properties. 
So now I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Angela, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so my topic today is dealing with uh, reserve study updates. Um, and what you're not going to hear from me is a nuts and bolts detailed description of, uh, of how to read a reserve schedule. Um, I'll leave that to the engineers. Uh, we don't have time to do that today. And even if we did, uh, they're better at it than me. Uh, but what we've discovered over the years and, and, and found over the years is that there are some practical issues uh, confronting, confronted by both boards and the managers of those boards uh, when it comes time to update your reserve schedule. Um, so I'm going to try to touch upon those practical issues and at least give you the benefit of, of our collective experience as to how we've navigated those, those experiences over time. So the first question is uh, when to update your reserve schedule. Um, and, and this is, I, I think most everybody's heard this, you know, over the years. Uh, the general rule is you ought to be updating it every three to five years. Um, I'm not sure where that number came from, uh, but I, I think it's been generally accepted now as, as uh, pretty much industry practice. But there are some exceptions. And that is, uh, you know, suppose a year into your reserve schedule, you, you need to do a substantial project um, at a time earlier than when, that, when, when the schedule predicted it. So your, your schedule said your roof has a remaining useful life of 10 years, and all of a sudden, uh, two years in, you're replacing it. Um, that, that change would be significant enough where you would not want to continue uh, funding at the current level without making that adjustment in the schedule. So again, three to five years uh, unless something substantial happens. And it could also be a change in the pricing. Uh, I'll discuss uh, a little bit later the whole issue of, uh, of unit costs and what to do with temporary blips in them. Uh, but, but if in general that the cost of materials has gone up dramatically and it doesn't appear to be a temporary change, uh, you may well want to adjust your schedule so that you're not behind in three to five years uh, in the future. Just a couple of thoughts on um, what not to do when you're deciding to, to implement or, or update your reserve schedule. Um, one of the things not to do is to avoid, is to don't avoid doing so because you know you won't like the result. And we've certainly seen associations that, uh, that have, not implement, have not updated their schedules for years and, and, and it becomes almost uh, impossible to then do so because they know that the result is going to be one that they're not going to like. You know, you're putting away $100,000 a year and, and it ought to be, uh, you, know, you pretty much know that since you haven't done this in 10 years, it, it's going to be two to 250 or whatever. Uh, that's not a good reason to not do it. In fact, it's a reason to do it because, you know, ignorance is not bliss. And, uh, and to the extent that you just ignore it, one day, uh, that, 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 that issue is going to confront itself and, and the result will be even worse than dealing with it up front. Uh, the second thing not to do is to, um, is to commission the study, but not be committed to implement the results once you have them. Uh, the only thing worse than not updating your schedule is updating your schedule and ignoring the results. Um, so if indeed you, you, you have a schedule, uh, you're now funding at $100,000 a year, you commission a study and, and the result comes in at 250 and you decide to ignore it, um, that's a mistake uh, because the auditor won't like it and will note it typically at the end of the year. And, and in fairness to all of the owners who, who live there today and who will live there in the future, it, it's, it's necessary and important that that future needs be funded uh, appropriately and, and as they're wearing out. So, you know, and, and these two, what not to do, uh, you know, th uh, thoughts sound almost inconsistent with one another. On the one hand, you know, don't, don't do it, uh, don't, don't, don't fail to do it because you don't like the result. But uh, when you do it, please put it, uh, please implement it. Uh, but I, I think the message is uh, bite the bullet do what you have to and, and commit to, uh, to taking the results, uh, even if unpleasant and finding some way to let them, uh, uh, to, to put them into your budget. Um, I just wanted to spend a moment talking about reserve study updates in the context of new construction. 
Um, you know, this, this uh, you know, may not apply or likely won't apply to most of you, but I have seen this issue um, uh, come up enough where, where I think it's important to, uh, to, to at least raise it. So in the context of the new construction, a, you know, the, the board is going through transition with their developer. One of the things they do is to hire an engineer to do the transition inspection and, and deficiency report. That engineer at the same time is always or, or typically commissioned to update the reserve schedule. But realistically, what they're being asked to do at that point is to do two things and to prepare two schedules with two very different uses. The one schedule they're preparing is, is what I you know, like to refer to as the look back schedule. What, what they're doing at that point is saying, if you've got a community that's going through transition today, that, uh, that the public offering statement was prepared in 2017 and the reserve schedule of the developer prepared in 2017, one of the things you want your engineer to do is to compare the funding that the engineer said was appropriate to reserves in 2017 with what your new association engineer says they would have put in the, in the budget in 2017. So it's looking back, it's uh, your, your engineer is putting themselves in the, in the shoes of the engineer of the developer back four years ago and saying, was this the appropriate number? And that's used for purposes of, of, of determining whether or not this was underfunded and, and is that a potential claim in the transition process. The other thing that happens, uh, however, is, is you're gonna want that same engineer today to project forward, to do the type of reserve schedule that we all do for up and running ongoing associations. Because you know, not only do you wanna use that, this as an opportunity to say, you know, developer, you, you either got it right or you got it wrong, but you also wanna make sure regardless of what's happened uh, since the, the inception of the association, you wanna be sure moving forward that you have enough money to properly fund the replacement of your major capital items as they wear out over time. Um, what, what I found over the years is that uh, two things. Number one, not all reserve update proposals specify that they're going to do the look back and the look forward. So you want to make sure that, that it indeed it, it calls for both. And second of all, you want to talk to the engineer about when should they do the look forward one. I've certainly seen it suggested that you don't necessarily want to do it immediately because during the course of transition negotiations, for example, if you have deteriorated concrete that the, associate, that the developer ultimately is going to replace, you don't want to necessarily do a look forward schedule and say this concrete uh, is, uh, is in substandard condition and will require a, a five-year useful life rather than 40. Um, you, know, you want to wait until that issue is potentially resolved. So the timing of the look forward schedule is, is, is up to uh, I, I think a, a reasonable, de reasonable debate as to when, but make sure the, the, the proposal includes it. Okay, so now the association selects an engineer, you, uh, you, you give them the relevant information that you need to, and they're going to be asking you, you know, can you tell us the last time the roofs were replaced? Can you tell us the last time you did paving? All of those things, and, and please cooperate with them because obviously, more, the more information you give them, the more accurate their ultimate uh, product will be. Uh, but now you get their draft report and you certainly want that in draft form. Because one of the things that uh, I think is true is reserve schedules are, uh, I would say perhaps 75% uh, science and 25% art. And there is some room for negotiation and there is some room for reasonable minds to differ. So what, what we wanna do then once we get this draft, whether you be a manager, whether you be a board member, is you wanna closely review and scrutinize what you've got. Um, you know, there could be mistakes in it, you know, maybe uh, rather than uh, you know, quantifying something, uh, you know, the unit is rather than square yards, it's square feet. So it's, you know, it's multiplying everything you know, uh, times nine. Or, or maybe, for example, the, they've got unit pricing for replacing your um, concrete walkways for X per square foot, and you just did a section of it for something different than that. Um, if you did it for less, you're gonna to wanna to provide that proposal to the engineer because they, they will oftentimes accept an actual quote that you've received 
or an actual uh, invoice that you've uh, you've uh, encountered to do work, um, you know, because most of their numbers are coming out of uh, out of manuals and uh, and and you know real real time proposals are are, are valuable and, and oftentimes um, it it puts you in a position to. Uh, uh, to, to perhaps reduce the number if, if that's going to be a, a problem. Um, you also want to, one of the things that I've, I've always found kind of interesting, and, and, and I haven't been through a reserve schedule in one of our communities in the last six months, but with the escalating cost, for example, of, of lumber, um, you know, you can bet that if you need to replace a, a deck today, uh, a wood deck, it's going to cost a whole lot more money than what was predicted three or four or five years ago. Um, but, but the question is, you know, how long is our lo lumber prices going to remain at their current levels? There was something in the, in the newspaper and the press a couple of days ago suggesting that, that they are softening a bit. And, and, and that's a conversation, I think, to have with the engineer. If, if they've put in current lumber prices um, and, and it's causing this number to go up dramatically, is that realistic and appropriate? You know, do we really think that lumber is going to remain at this elevated level for the long haul, or is it a temporary blip that, uh, that we can count on uh, or we can reasonably expect to come down? Um, you know, <laughs> one of the issues where this has become um, problematic in the past is, is with the cost of, uh, of petroleum. When, when petroleum prices, the cost of a barrel of oil, you know, dramatically increases over time, uh, what I have found is the engineering firms typically reflect that in their schedules. And, 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 and petroleum is a, is a major product in both asphalt paving as well as asphalt roof shingles. So it's got a dramatic effect on the material cost of those items. But again, you know, is that a temporary blip? Uh, you know, what we don't expect, I don't think, is our engineers to be economists. So we don't want to necessarily, you know, have them figuring out what's going to happen, happen to the price of oil. On the other hand, uh, you know, we also don't want to be paying, uh, and, and, this, and this goes both ways. If, if gas dropped, petroleum dropped dramatically, we also don't want to think that that's forever. So I think that, that, that it's worth having a reasonable discussion about how to deal with those those ebbs and flows and, 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 and price fluctuations to make sure that we have something in our schedule that we can live with uh, high or low and that it's not something that's temporary in nature. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to spend a few moments talking about the, um, the selection and, and the options for the types of reserve schedules. And again, uh, you know, I'll leave it to the engineers to uh, to get into the nitty gritty of just uh, you know the difference between full funding and threshold funding and baseline funding, I'll just spend a moment on it. But what what, well, what I think is important is that when when a board or management solicit a proposal from an engineering firm to update the schedule, that that's that that proposal provide those options that you, you want to know that um, that they're going to provide a scenario both at full funding and at threshold funding. And typically, the threshold funding has a couple of options within it. Uh, the, the third option is, is baseline funding, unless this has changed over time. I have found I have always always thought that baseline funding was uh, was uh, relatively irresponsible. So I never asked for that as an option because I, I don't want our boards to, to potentially pick it because it produces the uh, the lowest annual um, uh, transfer cost. Um, so what, what are the differences very quickly again, because this is really something that, um, that, you know, engineers uh, ought to be explaining to boards when they provide their proposals. I mean, full funding is pretty simple. It's what I've always referred to a straight line, you know, so if you have 10 items in your reserve schedule, you, you, you plot each of them and you say, okay, our roofs are going to cost us a hundred thousand dollars. We have, we have $10,000 in the bank today, so we have $90,000 to raise over the next remaining 10 years, remaining useful life of the, of the roof. And therefore we have $9,000 to raise every year. And we do that for each of the items, we add them all up, and that's the number that we put in the annual budget for the association. The threshold funding, I, I can tell you when it was first uh, described to me years ago, I, I scratched my head. And because threshold funding generally, not always, results in a lower annual contribution. 
And I scratch my head and say, Jesus looks like smoke and mirrors. But over time, I become convinced that it's responsible. Over time, the, the accounting firms that audit these associations that many of whom opt for threshold funding have found it to be responsible. And what it basically says is that the association establishes a threshold of what number in the reserve account are they not prepared to go beneath. So, and the threshold is typically expressed as a percentage of the total costs of the improvements of the association. And it's typically five or 10%. So that if you have a, a community where the engineer says, there's a million dollars in infrastructure costs to be incurred over time, at 5%, that says that you should never let your reserve balance go under $50,000. At 10%, you never let it go under $100,000. And the, and the schedule then works backward from those numbers. So if you look at the schedule over the next 30 years, if, if you pick the 5% threshold, you will see at some point that the, that, that the balance will go down to 50, but never under 50, and then up again from there. And the concept of threshold funding is it takes advantage of the the notion that we don't need more money in the association's account than we need to meet the year-to-year -year infrastructure capital uh, obligations of the association. So better homeowners should keep the money in their pocket rather than, uh, than the association keep it in, in, in its. Okay, so now you've gone through this process, you've selected your option, you now get the, um, you now get the, the draft, you negotiate the draft, you do the best you can, you say, geez, can't we, you know, suppose we decide to, uh, to, to, to defer doing our roofs for five years rather than three years, and, and the engineer ultimately agrees with that, but you still have a, uh, a result that uh, we'll call it a budget buster. You know, you, you have been, you've been putting away $50,000 a year, and this says you're, you need to go to 100. What do you do about that? You know, what you hopefully don't do is ignore it. Okay, you want to find a way to ultimately get to that hundred thousand dollars, and and make because you know ultimately the the accountant at the end of the year is going to ask for a copy of your most recent reserve schedule, and you don't want to, to them to say, "Geez, there was a hundred thousand dollar recommendation here, and you're still funding at 50. So instead, you want to have uh, you know maybe the way to get there is to is to incrementally increase to the hundred. So maybe you say we're committed to put in 75 next year and 100 in, in, in the next year or, or something different than that, but have a plan, memorialize the plan and be able to say to your auditor, we didn't ignore this. We also didn't put $100,000 in day one, but here's how we're gonna get from step A to step B. The other alternative that some of our communities have done is to say, you know, let's, let's find a way to jumpstart this schedule. Let's put some money in, whether it be existing, perhaps working capital uh, funds of the association, or, or perhaps even a special assessment to, to not have the maintenance fee go up dramatically. Maybe we can offset it with a transfer of monies, either existing or through a special assessment that jumpstarts the schedule. So we tell the, the, we tell the engineer, put this in as your starting balance rather than that, which will have the ultimate effect of causing the, uh, the uh, ultimate contribution to come down. And, and finally, um, once you determine what the plan is, um, you want to, and I've seen so many times over the years where the schedule um, is ultimately agreed to by the board, but that decision is memorialized nowhere. Um, you want to be sure that there's a set of minutes of your association that reflects the fact that the board, no matter what preceded it, negotiating, uh, you know, whatnot, um, there's something that says we as a board affirmatively have decided to adopt this schedule um, and, uh, and at an annual funding of X. So there's never any question that, uh, that this was not, that this is something that the board uh, ultimately agreed to, even if the first draft was something that, that caused them to guess. Um, so th th those are, you know, the, the, the types of issues that, that I've seen over the years that, uh, uh, like most things in life, uh, m most of these recommendations uh, are, are things that, uh, that, that we did wrong, uh, you know, at some point in our, in our, uh, in our history, and, and hopefully now we're in a position to, to not do them wrong and to give advice to others as to how to avoid these pitfalls. Wow, well, Mike, that was so thorough. Thank you so much. You really covered that topic. Uh, if anyone has questions for Mike, please feel free to type them into the question box and we'll come back to him at the end of the program. 
I'm now going to turn it over to Paul Migliore. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. That was a lot of great information, Mike. I was uh, thinking as you were talking about the escalating cause, costs of uh, building materials, what we've gone through over the past year, and it's really gone up dramatically uh, and plays a part into you know, what I'm going to talk about today, which is uh, damages and losses across multiple units in a multifamily environment. So, you know, typically uh, the types of losses that you'll be seeing in your communities could be fire, smoke, mold, and water. Um, you know, it really, I'll talk a lot about water because when you have a fire, you re resulting uh, damage is typically water and smoke as a result of them extinguishing the fire. In many cases, the water does more damage than the actual fire, except for some of the more extreme fires. So what I, what I want to do is share with you uh, the different types of water losses, the different categories of water, what it means to you as a resident board member and property manager. So, you know, there's really three types of water. The category one is water that originates from a potable source. Uh, it's typically clean, sanitary, drinkable water. It presents little or no hazard uh, due to the source itself. However, this could expand into a category two or a category three because there's risk that uh, there may be hazardous materials that comes in contact with that water, such as uh, electrical wiring or electrical devices. Uh, category two water contains significant contamination. So even though it may have originally uh, sourced from a, a clean potable sanitary source, um, it you know causes potential uh, illness in humans. Uh, it presents a moderate risk to the presence of gray water, such as uh, you know typically you're going to need PPE like coveralls, waterproof boots, rubber gloves when working uh, with this type of water. Uh, so it's not something that you know as a unit owner or maintenance staff, uh, you're just gonna go in with mops, buckets, clean up and uh, not protect yourself. It has uh, you know, typical health and safety risks uh, with this type of water. And then category three is grossly contaminated water. So typically anything after a fire is going to be contaminated uh, grossly by all the charred remains of the structure, the contents, uh, as well as anything else that may have been uh, in, in the building when they were putting water on the fire. Contains harmful pathogenic and toxigenic materials. Typically with uh, category three water damage, you have to take this pretty seriously. The presence of sewage and non-organic contaminants can be high, highly dangerous to the workers that are cleaning this up. Again, it's not something you just want to go in with a mop and a bucket. You know, the effects can be immediate or long-term. And, you know, typically you want full body PPE for this type of, of a cleanup. So, you know, the IICRC, which is, uh, you know, pretty much the, the gold standard in uh, categorizing what types of water intrusion, is you know they, they break it down into four classes of water. You know, class one water damage is a, a minimal amount of water. It's flowed through onto materials that are predominantly low in porosity, such as a, a hard floor, tile, uh, you know, vinyl flooring. Bulk of the water can be re removed, leaves minimal amount of evaporation needed to finish the drying. Yeah, typically a hot water tank on a sealed concrete floor or an overflowed uh, toilet on a tile floor would be what the IICRC would consider, consider a class one water damage. A class two water damage uh, is a significant amount of water discharged and exposed materials are medium to high porosity. Uh, greater absorption of the water into these materials and the water damage uh, process is lengthened by the volume of water that needs to be removed and a lengthened drying time. So examples of this would be a ruptured pressurized water line inside of a drywall. 
uh, cavity, you know, or a wooden floor joist system. So these things are going to take a little bit more work to dry. You may need some, some demolition, some drying equipment uh, to run for three or four days. Obviously, the faster you can get it dry, the less likely of mold growth down the road. Uh, so that, that's really the trick. You don't want to just kind of say, okay, it looks dry. You want to take moisture readings. You want to make sure that you are, in fact, getting the structure dry to keep it safe, healthy, and, and clean. And then the class three water damage is a large amount of water, regardless of its category, and it's absorbed by highly porous material. Uh, it's really the, the results in the highest rate of evaporation necessary to affect that water damage restoration process. Examples of this could be a storm forced leak uh, through a, a foundation, uh, floods a building's interior, soaks the carpets, uh, could be a broken water main or a broken pipe filling an underground parking area. So the, these are really large, large quantities of water in, in the building. And then, you know, again, those are gonna take uh, a larger scale cleanup effort. And then a class four water damage, water intrudes and it's trapped by building materials and assemblies which make the restoration process difficult, time-consuming, and expensive. Areas are highly porous or tightly confined. They require special methods and equipment, a longer drying time, and substantial vapor pressure differentials. Examples of this could be stormwater flooding of wooden, plaster, masonry, or concrete enclosures, or even a severe sewage backup that per permeates the floor and wall systems. For example, uh, if an upstairs toilet overflows and leaks into the downstairs unit, you're looking at a, a sewage backup, you're looking at enclosed cavities of, of your structure that need to be opened up and properly cleaned and sanitized to safely restore them back to a healthy environment. This can be across one unit in the case of a townhouse or a two family home. It could be across multiple units in the case of a condo or an apartment where you have separate units upstairs and downstairs. And th this takes uh, a quarterbacking, if you will, of the situation to coordinate this amongst the tenants or unit owners in both these, uh, both these units. So once the categories and the classifications of the water damage have been assessed, proper steps can then be taken to mitigate and repair the damage. Uh, flood damage you know, from a factory from black water will require a different process than say a potable water spill in an office building or in a multifamily home. You know, and each range of categories compounded by the class of the water uh, intrusion will require different skill sets for the mitigation company to handle this loss and safely do the right mediation and uh, mitigation. So, you know, the, the trick is knowing what you're dealing with. Most of the time, you know, people will be like, oh, it doesn't look wet. Uh, you really want to moisture map it, take moisture readings, use an IR camera, uh, what, you know, whatever tools are necessary to determine the extent of the damage and then properly mitigate it. So, so what, you know, what does that mean for property managers and board members as far as a decision-making process uh, that they need to follow or should follow when they have a loss? Most of the time, unit owners don't want to be disrupted. They don't want ceilings cut open if, if need be. Um, you know, and as the people directing the process, whether it be a board member or property manager, understanding the right way to do these things uh, helps when you need to uh, explain it to the affected unit owners. So, you know, understanding what is, what is water mitigation? You know, it's, it's really the water damage restoration shouldn't stop at, you know, the back of your real estate you know, at restoring your real estate back to proper function. 
So you want to inspect underlying causes that may cause water damage. Uh, this again goes into the reserve studies, understanding what condition systems in your buildings uh, are in and when repairs and uh, upgrades may be necessary. So repairing the structures and replacing the materials to make your property safe for years to come is really key. Uh, if your property has been exposed to a water damage, you may have to do water mitigation. You know, and strict, a strict actions are required and they're required to be performed in, in a timely manner. You want to remove the damaged materials such as drywall and flooring. Many times they're not going to, to dry quickly enough to prevent mold growth in the future uh, and then create an un unhealthy indoor air quality down the road or an unhealthy structure for people to, to habitate. You know, mold and mildew have accumulated in areas of the property, you know, for example, inside dark walls, inside the cavities. That's why walls need to be opened up and, and dried out. So typically a proper mitigation will entail uh, ventilating wall cavities or even doing, performing flood cuts and removing drywall in order to, uh, to dry these, these structures out properly. And again, when it affects multiple units, it's got to be coordinated with all the unit owners and tenants. So that, that's the challenge, is getting the, the buy-in from someone when you're telling them you need to cut open walls, you need to, uh, in essence, do demolition to their property to, to restore it properly. Uh, many times, it, you know, people think just set up fans and just set up air scrubbers and it'll all go away. And, and that's not, not really the case. You know, so what happens when you have a claim such as this, there's also the insurance side. You know, the insurance side looks at who's responsible for the loss, what type of loss is it? And that varies from policy to policy and uh, type of loss. For example, I just had uh, a water loss, multi-unit water loss, and the policy basically spreads the deductible amongst the unit owners and they share it equally. There's a per unit deductible, not a per loss deductible. Um, and then the repairs have to be performed uh, in, in, in the individual units. Other policies may have one deductible for that type of loss that is assessed to the association. And then based on your bylaws, the question is then, is that uh, assessed to the unit of origin or is that assessed across affected units? So the, these are things you may wanna look at as a property manager or a board member and understand in the event of a loss that affects multiple units, who's responsible for the deductible? Does the association eat it? Do they pass it through to the unit owners? Uh, you know, equally, or does it go to the unit owner uh, of cause and origin? So these are things you want to understand and might want to review prior to a loss. So you're, you're ready to handle that when the situation ar arises. You know, so, you know, kind of coming back to the water damage, since, uh, you know, typically that's what we see. We see broken sprinkler heads, you know, somebody hits a sprinkler head, you know, with a ball, a bat, you know, kids are playing in a unit, you know, whatever the cause may be, uh, they put out a high volume of water. So, you know, tips for, for the water damage restoration is get it done quickly. Don't wait. Get it done thoroughly so you don't have a secondary problem down, down the line. Your, your policy may not cover mold if it's a result of a water loss that was not addressed properly or reported properly or if it was an ongoing maintenance issue if you have uh and i've, I've seen properties where they've had uh dishwasher or washing machine discharge lines that were clogged and seeping and the unit owners weren't aware of it however once the walls started getting wet and the downstairs walls started getting wet, 
it was determined it was not a not a covered loss. So so these are the types of things you want to understand in your policy as to what is covered, what isn't covered, and have uh, procedures in place for for inspecting and preventing these types of losses before they occur. Uh, because typically, what you know when you're opening up walls to take care of a water damage that's not covered it and doing mold remediation at the same time, it can become a, a costly expense to the association and, uh, and the individual unit owners if it's, if it's assessed accordingly. So, so typically, you know, again, the, the mitigation that needs to occur across multiple units, you need to dry these units, you need to make them safe. In the case of mold, you want to set up containment, set up air scrubbers, for the area that you're working in and create a negative air environment. Many times unit owners ask, is this really necessary? Or, you know, can I take, uh, you know, the affected contents and move it somewhere else? As a board member or a property manager, you don't want to let them take a wet couch or a mold, even a moldy couch, more importantly, and move it to another unit because the, all they're doing is transferring that contamination. So, you know, people say, well, how harmful can it be? Well, it can be pretty harmful because when you think about it, the mold is growing on organic surfaces and sinks its roots into those surfaces, whether it be the structure of the building or the contents. And even when mold remediation is performed, and it's performed through a series of HEPA vacuuming, wire brushing, HEPA vacuuming, sanitization, and then sealing. What the sealing does is it encapsulates the structure and does not allow the mycelial fragments, which are the roots of the mold that are still remaining because you're not gonna get 100% of them out of, the, out of the wood. It prevents them from being able to grow back. So when a mold remediation is done properly, your mold will not grow back because it's been encapsulated. The wood may still remain stained on the structure, but it's no longer harmful. So when you have a mold situation, you really should engage with a hygienist to perform clearance testing after the work has been done to certify that it, it is a safe environment, uh, especially with multiple unit owners, so they can have peace of mind knowing that their their homes are safe to, to habitate. Uh, with mold, you have a number of respiratory issues and that varies from person to person. There's really no set level of mold that's acceptable or not acceptable. So the hygienists typically when they perform their testing will take an outside air sample and an inside air sample and compare the two. That gives them a feel for what's actually going on inside the building. And if anything is visible, they can also do surface testing. And then they can see what type of mold is present, how active it is, and whether it needs to be mitigated because mold is in, in the outside air and it is always there. So it's really just a matter of determining what's going on and it's not something that can you or I can just see and make a determination. With, you know, with that being said, when you uh, have fire and smoke, there's a whole different mitigation process that's involved. There's the, the cleaning, if it's just a light smoke situation that can be done with, with chem sponges and clean the surface, seal it and repaint it. And that may all be, be all that it's necessary to mitigate that type of situation. Um, in the case of fire, there may be structural damage that needs to be removed and reconstructed. Again, coordinating that with a engineer and obviously through the township uh, inspection and approval process. So when you're, when you're coordinating a loss across multiple units, the, the key takeaways are understanding your insurance coverage because every policy is different for every situation, as well as understanding what it takes 
on the front end of a loss. Because when you, when you have a loss of a larger scale, there's a lot more front end work that has to happen with the approval process from the insurance companies and the township for permitting. And the unit owners will think that there's not a lot going on when it's really happening behind the scenes. But as you know, if you understand that as a manager and a board uh, member, you can convey that to the affected unit owners. So you can then explain to them the process whereby uh, once the hammer starts swinging, then, then they feel things are moving along and they feel a little bit better about that. Um, so un understanding how uh, the process works is, is always a good thing. You know, I'm not an expert on policy. That would be, uh, you know, something for an insurance broker or agent to, to cover with you and consult with you. But under, understanding that everyone who's on this call, uh, your policies may differ in, in some way, shape or form based on a loss, based on deductibles and based on coverage. So, you know, really understanding your policies and understanding your bylaws are really key to quarterbacking multi-unit losses. The, the process of actual mitigation doesn't really change a lot depending on what they are. Um, it's, you know, really the key is bringing the building back to a safe, healthy uh, structure for, for your unit owners and tenants to uh, occupy. Do, does anybody, you know, are there any questions, Angela? Have you, you know, that, that pretty much yeah. sums up what I, you know, have here in the time allotted. Okay, so, great. Oh, you. yes, uh, we actually have a few questions. I just want to remind all attendees, please I use the question box if you want to add any additional questions. Um, I'm sorry, I have a first question for Mike. Mike? Um, when calculating uh, the amount to keep in reserves, is inflation taken into account, rising prices? That's a great question. And what I have found uh, is some, some engineers do and some engineers don't. Um, you know, some, and if you're gonna take into account inflation, you presumably also then wanna take into account interest or investment income on the funds invested in the bank. And, and again, I've found some engineers do it, others don't. And the, those that don't, I think their rationale is they're engineers, they're not economists. So they're not in a position where they're gonna to wanna to try to speculate as to what's gonna happen with either the cost of goods on an ongoing, uh, on a going forward basis or, uh, or what kind of money can be earned on the, on the money in the bank. And instead, that's why they say updated every three to five years, that's your hedge. If things uh, change dramatically, um, that you know you can't go too long with uh, with with, uh, with interest uh, eating into uh, with interest going through the floor, such that you're not earning what you expected, or or the cost perhaps of, of items going up much more uh, much more steeply than anybody could have predicted. So I, I think that's a conversation that every board ought to have with their engineers. If are they going to include those items, and and if so. Uh, you know, where are they going to get those numbers from? Right. Is that something typically to have a conversation with their accountant? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Because ultimately you want them to be comfortable when they do the audit that mm -hmm. the, uh, the end result is something that makes sense. Okay. Great. Uh, and one other question, how long typically does, a, does the reserve study take? How much time should be allotted for that? Um, uh, you know, I would think that depending on the time of year, I mean, obviously, uh, if you send them out in uh, in January, you're probably not going to get it back. Or if you want to know what you know the condition of the concrete, mm -hmm. uh, it's covered by snow, uh, it's not going to work. I, I would think you probably ought to figure 60 days to get a draft reasonably, because there is some preliminary work the association has to do before the before the engineer can even go out and do their inspections and generate a report. Okay, great. 
All right, okay. if uh, anyone has any other questions for Mike, please feel free to uh, put them into the question box. Uh, Paul, a couple of questions for you. What do you see uh, as the manager's role when coordinating uh, multi-unit loss? So great, great question. Typically, the, ma the manager's role is going to be one of coordination between their restoration partner and the unit owners. Uh, you know, typically, they're the ones that have to deal with the insurance carrier, with the restoration company, and also conveying uh, information to the unit owners as to uh, what their obligations are whether it be financial, whether it be logistical, uh, they also act as the liaison between the board and the restoration partner, um, as well as you know, helping uh, quarterback some of the decisions, whether it be mm -hmm. material selections uh, or you know, right on down to where you know where where vehicles park, access to the building. Uh, you know, all, a lot of the small details that, you know, need, need to be handled that neither party, whether it be the unit owner or the restoration partner, uh, can make those decisions. You know, there may be a freight elevator that needs to be used in the case of a high rise versus, you know, the uh, personnel elevator. So typically they're going to be the quarterback and the go between between the restoration partner and the unit owners and the board. Okay, and uh, what about insurance coverage for uh, an individual unit owner? Does the uh, manager play a role in that as well? So typically, as uh, when it comes to the insurance coverage, most policies for the associations cover the building back to builder's grade or original builder's offering. The, the unit owner's individual policies typically will cover improvements and betterments. Any improvements or upgrades that they've made to their unit would fall onto their insurance as well as their, their contents and their alternative living expenses if they're displaced from their unit. So the association's insurance typically puts the building back to the original offering and the unit owners will cover any improvements and betterments, alternative living expenses and uh, contents. Okay, great. Uh, if anyone has any other questions for Paul, uh, we still have time, so uh, feel free to add. Uh, okay, I have one other question uh, for, for Mike. Um, in developer transition, how strong is the claim of inadequate reserve funding in a POS budget? So, um... I assume this is the situation where the develop where the association engineer does the so-called look back um, reserve schedule, and it says in 2017 the developer's uh, engineer said you should have been putting away a uh, hundred thousand dollars a year into reserves, and we think the right number should have been two hundred thousand. What do you do with that hundred thousand dollar difference, and how strong is the claim of inadequate reserve funding in that POS budget? Uh, my experience is. Uh, working with you know lawyers over the years, it, it is certainly not the strongest of claims um, for a couple of reasons, and not not one that you would necessarily uh, you know fight to the to the you know for the last nickel on. And the reason for that is twofold, I think. Number one, the, the as I mentioned before, the reserve schedules are are part science and part art, and there are and reasonable engineering minds can differ as to some of the issues that go into the schedule. So. You know, the, the, how long is the remaining useful life of, of the roof? Uh, what is the proper unit pricing? Um, even what items ought to be in a reserve schedule? Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I've seen some, some, some differences of opinion, reasonable differences of opinion there as well. The second reason goes to the question of who, who was harmed if the association's initial budget didn't put aside enough money into reserves. The, the truth is that the people who purchased from the developer in the early years benefited from the underfunding in the sense that they paid less per month you know, in, in their monthly maintenance fee than they would have had the reserve schedule been done properly. Um, so that the developers have argued year after year and every time this comes up 
you know, you, you, you weren't hurt. Even if we were wrong, you weren't hurt because the right number uh, would have caused you to pay more sooner. Now you're just going to pay more later. Um, the one place it does have some application is if the developer is funding uh, the association over that period of time and is in, and they benefited from the underfunding and should have paid more. That I think is, 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 is the easiest uh, and most quantifiable, easiest quantifiable um, claim to make. But the rest of it becomes a little bit more dicey and, and harder to prove. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone uh, and remind our attendees that we will be sharing our the contact information for the presenters. So please feel free to email them. And I uh, hope to see you all in two weeks and at our upcoming events. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Angela. Thank you.